What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Wednesday in the second week of Lent, we continue on with some harsh teachings from Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, our Lenten catechesis picking up on Article 2 of the Apostles' Creed, and of course, a quote from the ancient church. Stick around. <music> So we're picking up in Mark chapter 7, and this we've seen some of the wonder, some of the grace, and some of the mercy of God in his Son, Christ Jesus, for sinners and for those broken by the fall. But we remember that Jesus is not always love and peace and patience, man. Uh, he's not hippie Jesus, uh, which is one of the many false Christs that the world has invented. We're looking to Christ, and we see him as he is. He is tolerant and intolerant at the same time. So we're going to see a little bit of the intolerance of Jesus towards false teaching and that infamous vain tradition of men. We begin in Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is a corbin that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So there we have it. Um, I suppose I should close up shop as a, a liturgical confessional Lutheran that likes chanting and hymnody and kneeling and genuflecting and making the sign of the cross and the bells and smells of historic Christian worship. I should just set up shop and be done, shouldn't I? Those vain traditions of men. Jesus never condemned tradition of men. What he condemned was the uplifting of tradition of man over and above God's word. You see, Jesus isn't saying, don't wash your hands, you silly person. He's saying, it's not about, wa wash your hands. It's a good tradition, but don't judge my disciples because what's going into them isn't defiling them. What comes out of them, <laughs> like what comes out of you, that defiles you. And an interesting side note here, uh, we read of this ceremonial washing, the cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Now, there's two words uh, in Greek uh, to wash with water, nipto and the more familiar baptizo. 
which uh, the American evangelical will say means to immerse. But you don't immerse dining couches, do you? You sprinkle them with water. You're not dunking your whole couch. That's a stupid way to wash a couch. Even in modern times, we don't dunk our couch. We use as little water as possible, and we shampoo it. Baptizo, to wash with water. So baptism <laughs> is the application of water with God's word. Baptizo, to wash with water. Interesting side note there. Now, there are very good reasons God had in the Old Testament for declaring certain things clean and unclean. He was setting apart for himself a people, a people from which would come the human lineage of his eternally begotten son. So these laws had their purpose, and it was well-intentioned to build up traditions around these laws. And Jesus doesn't say, don't build up tradition to preserve the word of God, but when your tradition supersedes the word of God, that becomes a problem. And evangelicals have many traditions that they build up to protect the word of God that have superseded it to the point where they can't even interpret the word anymore. Some Lutherans do that too. Rome does that. We're all guilty of it. But it doesn't mean tradition is a bad thing. The focus of Jesus here is that God's word makes it clear what goes into us is what, or what goes into us is not what defiles us but what comes out. And during this penitential time of the season of Lent, maybe we should spend a little bit of time reflecting on what comes out of us so that we can repent. And God, hearing our confession and seeing our repentance, delights to forgive sinners. We turn to Philip Melanchthon and the Augsburg, or the apology of the Augsburg Confession. They also quote another passage about perfection. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Matthew 19.21 This passage has stirred up many who have imagined that casting away possessions and the control of property is perfection. The abandonment of property has no command or advice in scriptures. Evangelical poverty does not come from the abandonment of property, but from not being greedy from not trusting in wealth, just as David was poor in a most wealthy kingdom. Since the abandonment of property is merely a human tradition, it is a useless service. But they say Christ speaks about perfection here. Indeed, those who quote the text in a butchered way violate it. Perfection is found in what Christ adds. Follow me. Matthew 19.21 Here he presents an example of obedience to one's calling. Because not all callings are the same. This calling does not belong to everyone, but only to that person with whom Christ speaks. In the same way, we are not to imitate the call of David to the kingdom, 1 Samuel 16, or of Abraham to slay his son, Genesis 22. Callings are personal, just as business matters themselves vary with times and persons. However, the example of obedience is general. Perfection would have belonged to that young man if he had believed and obeyed his vocation. So with us, perfection is that everyone with true faith should obey his own calling. This is from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, a defense of what the Lutherans believe against Rome's um, stance that the Lutherans are wrong. <laughs> um, so uh, as a Lutheran, I firmly believe we should trust the promises. But there are promises in Scripture that are not for us. Um a rough one, a tough one, I would say, one that is indirectly for us, but not directly for you, is the promise for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. This verse is taken out of context and abused all the time. This was spoken to God's people in the Babylonian captivity, and the benefit that we have is God's plan for, for them to prosper them, to give them a hope and a future, to bring them back to Jerusalem. The benefit that we have is this continues on in his plan to bring forth the human lineage of his eternally begotten son. So this is good news. And, and I like that the Lutheran fathers divided up the promises. This one's not for you. I mean, should we read the Bible and see that God says we should sacrifice our firstborn son and go out and do it? No, we're going to end up in a courtroom looking like a lunatic for murdering our child. The promise of the cross, that's for you. The promises associated with baptism, that's for you. The promise associated with the forgiveness of sin attached to the body and blood of Christ, that's for you. The promise that when you confess your sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive your sins, that's for you. 
There's a lot of for you promises in the Bible, but some of them are just history. Some of them are promises to other people, and we should not twist them to make them about us because the Bible is not about us. It's about Jesus for us. And knowing that one simple sentence changes drastically how we read the Bible. Now, let's focus on our catechesis for this uh, second week in the season of Lent, and we'll find out who this Son of God is. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Here we learn to know the second person of the Godhead. We see how he has completely poured forth himself Matthew 26, 28, and withheld nothing from us, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. When we had been created by God the Father and had received from him all kinds of goodness, the devil came and led us to disobedience, sin, death, and all evil, Genesis 3. So we fell under God's wrath and displeasure and were doomed to eternal damnation just as we had merited and deserved. There was no counsel help or comfort until this only and eternal son of God in his immeasurable goodness had compassion for our misery and wretchedness. He came from heaven to help us, John 1, 9. So those tyrants and jailers are all expelled now. In their place has come Jesus Christ, Lord of life, righteousness, every blessing and salvation. He has delivered us poor, lost people from hell's jaws, has won us, has made us free, Romans 8, 1 through 2, and has brought us again to the Father's favor and grace. He has taken us at his own poverty under his shelter and protection, Psalm 61, 3 through 4, so that he may govern us by righteousness, wisdom, power, life, and blessedness, we pray. Almighty and merciful God, Defend your church from all false teaching and error that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God and rejoice in your good gifts of life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.